Shukran. Thank you for staying within the limits. I'd like to come over on my side a little bit, geographically, and um, ask Joe Lieberman, before you go into your statement, explain something to me. There's lo the, the massacres and the bloodshed in Syria is a lot greater than it was in Serbia or in Kosovo or in Libya. We intervened there but didn't intervene here, though there are so many more lives at stake. Could you and then any of the gentlemen here explain to me uh, why we treat these two these cases differently? Uh, that, thank you, Joe. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's a good question and one we're all going to have to wrestle with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the reality is that there's no good answer to it. I can tell you that the military situation in uh, Syria is more complicated than it was in Libya. But the reality is that the humanitarian disaster that we feared Gaddafi would impose on his people that led us to intervene to support the uh, Libyan opposition forces is being played out right now. In other words, the disaster that we feared would happen in Libya is happening in Syria now. And um, I was going to say this in re my remarks, I'll say it now, the, the votes of Russia and China yesterday really put them on the wrong side of history. And if they persist in these positions, they will be as isolated in the world community as the Assad regime is. Uh, I hope <clears throat> that they will reconsider. I know that uh, Minister Lavrov went to, is in Damascus today. Perhaps he can uh, convince Assad that his time is running out. But if he doesn't, um, one thing I know is that we cannot stand idly by. And uh, there's many things we can do. We, we can form a contact group on Syria. We can begin uh, uh, to uh, provide assistance to the Syrian Free Army. Um, and, and there are many ways without being directly involved militarily that we can do that. But um, the bottom line answer to your question is that there's no good answer. And we have to wrestle with that and produce action. Well, that's it. Okay. That's it. That's that, it. Well, that's not my five minutes. That doesn't count. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. No, no, here's you just use that too. Okay, so <laughs> here, here's what I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> I'm honored to be on this panel, except for the moderator. I'm the only person on the panel who's not in the region. Uh, and uh, I want to give a perspective uh, from uh, the U.S. and perhaps the rest of the non-Middle East world uh, as to how to respond. These uh, remarkable revolutions of the last year in the Arab world are, in my opinion, the most significant uh, geopolitical realignment that has occurred in the Middle East since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And they um, have elicited in uh, the American people, and I presume people in Europe and elsewhere, two feelings, and they are conflicting. One is a feeling of excitement and the other is a feeling of unease. The excitement, of course, is because these uprisings are so consistent with our own national democratic uh, values. But um, we are also uneasy or unsettled because um, these revolutions are, in many cases, bringing to power political parties and leaders that describe themselves as Islamists. So um, how to resolve um, that tension, which doesn't only exist in um, the non-Arab uh, or Islamic world, but exists in, inside Arab societies as well, that fear that um, secular dictatorships will be replaced by repressive uh, the theocratic rule. And unfortunately, there is some history <clears throat> excuse me, that encourages those fears, beginning, of course, with the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, over the last 30 years, the greater Middle East has suffered some violent extremist movements uh, that have premised their authoritarian political agendas on religion. But in fairness, 
we need to be very careful not to treat political Islam as monolithic. It is not. We must distinguish between violent Islamist extremists like Al-Qaeda and the regime in Tehran and Islamic political movements, which in my opinion are best exemplified by Prime Minister Jabali and Tunisia Zanata party, which are neither violent nor extremist. Only time will tell how this new generation of Islamists who owe their legitimacy to elections <coughs> will act in power. We know from history that the transition to democracy can be long and uncertain. We also know the habits and institutions of uh, tyranny are difficult to discard and that those of democracy are difficult to develop. But as a matter of principle, we in the non-Arab, non-Islamic world must judge political parties, leaders, and governments there, <clears throat> excuse me, by their actions, not by their names. And we must remember that we've long accepted as natural and normal in American and European societies that political movements and leaders can and will draw reference and inspiration from their religion while still remaining firmly within a democratic framework. After all, our American <coughs> Declaration of Independence, the first American document says that the founders were creating this new government to secure the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that were the endowment of the creator, of God, not of Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, not even of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, but of God. And we've found a way since then uh, to um, respect religion, not establish an official religion, and tolerate uh, and, and encourage other religions. And of course, here in Europe, leading political parties describe themselves as both Christian and democratic. So the key question is not whether a government is led by Islamist or secularist, but how that government behaves, what it does, whether it respects personal freedoms, including <clears throat> women's rights and the rights of religious and ethnic minorities, whether people in power are regularly held accountable in free, fair elections, whether institutions like the police, judiciary, and the private sector are politically independent, and whether international commitments, responsibilities, and treaty obligations are upheld. I personally find it much more likely that the current coalition in Tunisia will meet these criteria than some secular governments in the Middle East. In fact, the most egregious human rights violations, in fact murder, taking place in the Middle East as we speak, are being perpetrated by a thoroughly secular regime, namely the Assad dictatorship in Syria. So, in conclusion, uh, how do we resolve the non-Arab, uh, non-Islamic tension I described? I, I think we have only one choice, which is to go with our values. We've got to be more excited than unsettled by the political changes in the Arab world uh, because they reflect values that we will find very uh, familiar. Those values also require that we not feel obliged to support any governments that emerge after the revolutions uh, that are neither democratic uh, nor tolerant. But they also <clears throat> require us to get involved to support those governments that are democratic and tolerant. You remember the, the uh, phrase of old about the hottest places in hell being reserved for those who in times of moral crisis or moral opportunity attempt to maintain their neutrality. That's not an option here. It's not an option with regard to what's happening in Syria today. And in, in another sense, it's not an option with regard to what's happening in Tunisia. If I were a, um, what I might call a democracy investment counselor, 
and I were forming a democracy support venture capital fund, uh, I would urge the fund to quickly invest as mon much money as it could gather in Tunisia <coughs> because the uh, returns on that investment will be great there and I think throughout the Arab world. What we will find, if I may respond to Ms. Carmen's brilliant speech and challenge is that what we have described for too long in good faith as Western values are in fact universal values and they deserve universal support. Thank you very much. Thank you.